Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of my past week in reading for this early part of October. The first thing that I read this month was A Tale of Monstrous Extravagance, Imagining Multilingualism, which is a transcription of a speech that Thompson Highway gave to a group in Edmonton a few years ago, and it is, as the subheading Imagining Multilingualism suggests, about what it means to speak multiple languages. Thompson Highway, of course, is the playwright who wrote uh, Dry Lips Ought to Move to Capus Casing and who wrote the novel The Kiss of the Fur Queen. And this is a short little thing being just a speech. He grew up in a Cree family in a Dene neighborhood and then went to an English-speaking residential school and then learned French as a student, but also his husband is French-Canadian and they lived in France for 10 years. So his whole life is about this dance of languages, which he presents together with discussions of music. So the speech itself is primarily in English, but there are bits that are in Cree, there are bits that are in French, there are bits about different ways of saying things in different languages, and analogies about music as language, which I thought was interesting because I ended up reading a number of other books this month that talked about music, so this was a good way to start the trend. In any case, it's super short, so there's no reason not to read this. So on the theme of music, the uh, next thing that I read was Julian Barnes' The Noise of Time, which is a novel that speculates about Shostakovich's thought processes at the various points when he was denounced, which is sort of every 12 years, and then at the point where he joins the Communist Party, and then eventually to the end of his life. It was interesting, this is a super short book, but it actually took me a really long time to get through the initial part, which is about, which is the one that's set in the 1930s, right after Stalin has denounced his opera. And it wasn't different stylistically from the rest of the novel, so I don't know why I found that so much harder to get through. Aside from the fact that maybe it was talking about a certain period in his music that I was less familiar with, because I don't know if it mattered as much that later he's talking about writing music that I knew about, so then you would think about that and it affects the way you read the words. I'm not sure. I definitely think this would be a good pairing to either a, a biography of Shostakovich or a history of these that period in Soviet history. I did quite enjoy reading this, but I find that I don't have a lot to talk about it in any kind of depth, which I feel like everything I could say about this would be comparing it to something else or pairing it with something else. I quite enjoyed it, but uh, I don't have a lot to say about it. So I followed that up by reading Schober Rao's an Unrestored Woman, which is a series of short stories, primarily, although not exclusively, about women, and primarily, but not exclusively, about the time around Partition. Interestingly, she never tells the story that I think everybody thinks of when you think of Partition, and you think of women who were going to be gang raped, so they killed themselves by throwing themselves into a well. None of the women in this book kill themselves by throwing themselves into a well. And I feel weird saying that specifically, but I genuinely went into this expecting that at least one of these stories would be a woman who throws herself into a well, and that doesn't happen. So, so it, it definitely exceeded my expectations in the sense that I was expecting this to be a take on the kind of set stories that you imagine you know about terrible things that happen to people at the point of, at, during partition, and this is definitely about terrible things that happen to people around partition, but it wasn't necessarily the ones that you think you know. So there were definitely people committing suicide, but often under circumstances that are unexpected. So there are stories about, for example, people being reunited, and that ends up being worse than if they hadn't been. A lot of the stories are centered around Hindu women, but not exclusively. There are definitely Muslim characters and Sikh characters, and there's one British character. And as I said, not all of them are set right at partition. There are a couple that are set, there's one that's set more current day, there's one that's set probably in the 80s or 90s, there's one that is set back in the 1800s. But all of them are paired with a story that is set in partition, because each of these have a character that repeats in a single story. So there'll be one story about one character, and a supporting character from that story will appear in the next one. Which, on paper, I like, because it's nice to find out what happened to people. But ultimately, I ended up thinking it was a weakness, because there were a few where the second story was weak, and it didn't really tell us much more about the character that we knew from the first one, so I felt like some of those weaker stories were only included because they needed to be paired with the original, and I actually thought that dragged this down. Overall, though, I quite enjoyed this. 
but yeah, I think the the pairing, while it's an interesting choice, didn't necessarily always work to make this as strong as an, of an overall collection. So after that, I picked up Hida Veloria's Born Both, an intersex life. Hida Veloria was really one of the early, when you first started seeing people discussing intersex issues on television in North America, she was really one of the four or five people that you regularly saw who really put herself out there. So I really admire the activism that she's done just in visibility terms. So I was really interested to read her memoir and see how she got herself on that journey to putting herself out there. Unfortunately, this memoir is not particularly well put together. There are definitely interesting stories in here, but I would say easily a third, maybe more of this, felt like it needed another round or two with the editor. There are a number of narrative pieces where she starts out, as a lot of memoirists do, talking a bit about childhood, but the threads from that about her family of origin are dropped almost entirely, so that when family members show up later in, the, in her life, I was almost surprised at various points. I, mean, I hadn't realized her mother was still alive there because these people genuinely disappear. And in addition to that, a lot of, there are a lot of stories in here that are stories that you can imagine somebody telling you at a party and you don't necessarily want to hear them. I don't know if you've ever met anyone who's very invested in telling you how edgy they are and they want to tell you about how they dropped acid when they were at Burning Man. But there is an entire chapter in here that is that conversation. And I thought some editor should have told her to take that out because it's not compelling reading. And then, you know, and she refers back to that at various points in a way that I think weakened the broader narrative. Also, she changes a number of names of people. But as I said, because she was one of a very small number of people who were, were visible when it comes to uh, public intersex advocacy, it's really obvious who those people are, even though she's changed their names. So she might be calling someone by a name, but you go, well, I know who that is. And, and it was just very strange that she went to the trouble of changing a person's name, but that it's, they're still 100% recognizable. And, and you, I sat there going, I know who that is. This is ridiculous. There's one point in this memoir where she's thinking about agreeing to go on a reality show and she decides that she doesn't want to put her life out there. But a lot of this book reads like a reality show. Overall, I'm still glad that I read this because again, I think as an advocate, she has been extremely important and I have, again, the utmost respect for her in terms of her activism. But this memoir was just not very engaging as a memoir. And also I've seen some people talk about wanting to put this on, on school reading lists as, as sort of a primer for intersex issues. And I really don't think that that's what this is. She does talk a bit about the history of movements both for public awareness and against non-medically necessary surgeries on infants. And unfortunately, there isn't that much out there that I think would work on a curriculum, but this would be a really weak entry in that. There was also a point that, that I found kind of eyebrow raising in that she talks about how for a while there was this trend of using disorders or differences of sexual development as opposed to intersex as a label. And while I agree with the overall point that's a, that that's a super medicalized way of framing it, when she talks about why other people might prefer that, she like in passing mentions a couple of specific uh, genetic and medical conditions that would fall under differences of sexual development, but not necessarily fall into intersex as she frames it in the being both sense which is to say people who are not different in the sense that they have both male and female traits, but different in the sense that they have most of one, but are missing some part of it. Because her personal situation is basically not medical in that kind of sense. She has what is basically a neutral physical difference that is given social importance, but not necessarily medical importance. So it makes sense that that's her personal framework. But when she's talking about the greater advocacy community, I was surprised to see her so dismissive of the fact that there are other populations who would be included in the one label who aren't included in the other, even though I do think that there are problems with re-medicalizing the terminology. And again, it's a personal memoir, so maybe she didn't want to get into it, but I think the trouble with being one of the few people who has written a memoir who is also an intersex advocate and such a well-known one is that people are going to read this and have a notion about this, which he keeps coming back to being both male and female. 
which for that community of people who have conditions that is essentially making them closer to being neither rather than both i think that had some unfortunate implications to it in any case i was still glad i read it next up to get ready for the get graphic readathon that's happening this weekend actually by the time i post this it may be over but in any case i read a couple of comics material the first one was volume one of the elf series this is le castel des elfes bleus which the crystal of the blue elves i think is also the english title because this has been translated into english this is a pretty straightforward fantasy story there's a guy and an elf and they ride polar bears and they're going the art is lovely in this the story is pretty generic because the elves are blue and there's one that one runs around nude for a good part portion of it i did find myself thinking about the if you've watched the honest movie trailers the honest game trailers for things like avatar any of the x-men movies that have mystique in them mass effect whenever they talk about a naked blue woman and they say bloobs that's what i was thinking in this so i couldn't take it too seriously for a whole section because of the naked blue elves in any case it, this is a fairly generic story but the art is just fantastic in it so i would definitely recommend it if you like fantasy art but and in addition also in comics i picked up Injustice Gods Among Us Year 3 Volume 2 because I'm clearly reading this series all out of order. I talked about some more of the Injustice comics last month and I've been talking about them for a year I think. I liked this quite a bit more than I liked most of Year 4 because they were still doing some interesting things with new characters that they brought in. Uh, and specifically John Constantine was in it which who I like and who I've surrendered to pr pronouncing that way since now there's going to be a new animated TV series and that's the pronunciation they're using so I'm going with that. In any case, it was entertaining, but as I always say with this series, depends if you like to see a bunch of characters. Not necessarily the best character stuff, but if you like superhero crossovers, good stuff. And then finally I got around to reading Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Tien, which won the Giller last year. It was on the Man Booker shortlist. And it is a story that jumps back and forth between Vancouver in the current day and in the early 90s and between China at basically three periods in history, although the main two are during the Cultural Revolution and then during the Tiananmen Square protests and massacre. And the characters are primarily from these two families who are interlinked because two of them have this, I don't know whether to call it an intense friendship or a kind of platonic romance, because I think either of those fit. I mean, even maybe romance romance. That's kind of not the point so much as it just gives us a joining point so that these characters are going to meet each other and we're going to see how history treats them because in a number of places these people are in situations where they're having to be characters don't see their brothers for 40 years because they're sent to work in a different part of china where people want to get away from that so they go to north america and they disappear so there's a lot of people being kept apart and the stories people tell and this kind of dance of language and also because the characters of the middle generation are all musicians, one is a composer, one is a violin player, and one is a pianist, there are constant musical references. In a way, it reminded me of both The Noise of Time, because it had that same, you, you were constantly being encouraged to think of musical pieces, and there were a couple of parts in here where I didn't feel as connected, and I realized it was because most of the musical references in those parts were to different works from Prokofiev, who I'm not as familiar with as a lot of the other composers that they mentioned, so I felt more connected to those pieces than to others. So it was funny how that had an impact on how I read this. But it also talks about not just music, but also language, because the character whose narration links this work is a, a woman from Vancouver who speaks very rudimentary Cantonese and doesn't speak Mandarin at all and only vaguely reads Chinese. So when she's figuring out characters, she's talking a lot about differences in meaning and differences in tone and differences in simplified versus traditional writing, which is all really interesting stuff. I thought this was super compelling, especially if you were a fan of both the historic the historical periods but also if you're interested in something that muses on language and music and all of that if you've read any of these what did you think of them and also i'd be curious to hear what you think about references internally because i know i've talked about that in terms of both musical references in these books and i wonder how you react to references that you either get or don't get anyway <laughs> that's it for now ciao